Today in Ghent, Johan Museo just three days after his third win in the Tour of Flanders, but he's never won this one. He's only finished second and third. One rider who has done well when this was a race for the sprinters, Mario Cipollini of Italy, winner in 92 and 93. Let's go to Paul Sherwin now, who's with Frankie Andreu. Frankie, Ghent Wevelgem's a special race. It's a race for the sprinters, and it's always hard to put a name on the man who's going to win. By 11th. You seem very confident. I think Blyleven's might just miss out a little bit because you've got to get over those climbs and you've got men like Zabel, Cipollini and Tom Steeles. Uh, that was my next guest, Steeles. <laughs> it's a sprinter's race and yeah, you got to get over the cobbles, but I think uh, I'm, I think TVM because Blyleven's didn't do uh, Flanders, Capio, another powerhouse for this kind of race, and then uh, Steeles, uh, Chippo, Zabel, I don't know, maybe I think Zabel might want to be saving himself a little bit for Roubaix. Tom, this is the race that you won last year. A lot of pressure on your shoulders to go out and win again. But with Mappé, you've got a lot of riders who stand a chance to win. Yeah, at this moment, I think everybody is a uh, top shape. Yeah. It's only, for me, the most important thing is to, to stay in the front. And when, there is a, when I'm still in the front, last 10 kilometers, then it's, it's my race. Yeah. Before that, it's, uh, it's, the ra it's the race for the other ones. Eh? How's morale in the team? Because that was a fantastic performance last weekend in the Tour of Flanders with Johan Museo and all of the MAP-A squad. I think uh, it's, it's great. Eh? Uh, it's, it's very relaxing. Uh, and when you win one race, it's more easily to win another one. Eh? Uh, so nothing. we don't have to win today. We just have to, to race well. And uh, it's a big difference. Eh? This was a race last year that both you and Stuart were riding very well in. It's normally a race for the sprinters, but you're the kind of guys who can just get clear in the last kilometre. Yeah, um, that's pretty much the tactic today. Uh, look after Fred for the sprint, but if uh, the opportunity arises, we're out of there a kilometre or 500 metres to go. Or try and do what Sawgren and uh, Guamont did last year and take the other take the other guy. I think today is probably going to be... Uh, to be a 10, 15 man group getaway, there's too many strong guys in the bunch here to be waiting around for a sprint, I think. You started your professional career off riding for Rabobank, a Dutch team, and you moved on to Gann, and now you're riding alongside Stuart O'Grady, and the two of you seem to make a very good pair when it comes down to racing. Yeah, I think so. I think, it's, uh, I think we're pretty much pretty hungry for these races, and uh, when you're aggressive um, and being two mates together, same race, have the same passion, so it's great to be up there and and to think, oh, okay, if I don't make that break, well, he's going to be in that. And uh, it, coming down to the finish, I mean, it didn't work last year, but hopefully it's going to work this year. Well, Christian, first year as a professional, and you're already riding all of the big races. It must come as a bit of a shock. Yeah, it's quite a bit of a shock. Uh, the weather for first is not exactly pleasing. And then I talk about cobblestones and rain and all that. It, it's, it's great, though. 
Last weekend, Tour of Flanders was your first actual attempt at one of the major World Cup events. What did you think? Oh, I mean, it was. Um, I was just my eyes were bright open, and I uh, I slipped a little bit too far at the back for one second, and the race was over for me pretty much. I mean, it's it's amazingly long and amazingly fast at the same time, and twisty, turny, anything could happen. What's it feel like for a rookie to come to a race like this and ride along the guys that you were reading about last year and looking at on the videos? Truthfully, I, I'm not even concerned with them. I'm just concerned with myself staying upright and just like trying to stay at the front. I don't care who it is next to me. It's just I'll have time for that to think when I'm racing against them later. Any hopes for today? Oh, yeah, I think we have uh, Sven's riding quite well, and uh, I'm going to do my best to keep him up there to, towards the front. And hopefully I'll be in the end, give him a good lead out. Good luck. Thank you. So, Sven, looks like things are coming together at the right time here, and all of your teammates have a lot of confidence in you for victory today. That should be a good circuit. It's not too long like Sunday. It's 200k, so it should suit me better, and the climbs are not too hard, and I think it be, should be good in a field sprint or in a small group coming to the finish. The thing about Game Wevel Game is the race always splits up at the Kemmelberg, but you have to fight back if you're a sprinter and hope to get into the finish line with the rest. I think I gotta sit in the whole day and then just go for the camel to be in the first group and it splits up then go maybe with 20 30 guys coming to the finish that should be good for me. Well it would indeed be good for Sven Turtenberg of US Postal Team who is a great sprinter evidenced by his two big stage wins in the Tour de France when he took the major share of the honours there. Well a sad start to the event because the rider is being called to the line here and a moment of respect for the former world champion Rudy Darlins who had an accident in his car traveling to the finish of the Tour of Flanders on Sunday and died two days ago in hospital. Rudy Darlins was in fact one of the top bike riders of Belgium. He was also an extremely nice personality and was now beginning to make his way as a television commentator. His greatest moment came in the World Championships in Japan where he was a surprise but delighted winner. Rudy Darlins in the breakaway here with Dirk De Wolf. And at the finish, De Wolf had to give best to his countrymen. A 1 2 for Belgium. And earlier in the same year, Rudy Darlins was in the thick of the action in the Tour of Flanders, beaten only by Moreno Argentine of Italy in the end. And in 1986, the great Sean Kelly was the only one who got in front of him in the Paris-Roubaix. Adrie van der Poel had finished third. In 1987, a year later, in atrocious conditions, Rudy Darnins was very much in the thick of the action. At the finish, beaten by Eric van der Arden, but even so, he finished third. He was one of Belgium's most popular riders. He won one stage of the Tour de France, this should have been another one. Inside the last kilometre, he overcook the corner and he crashed. The race went through on the inside, he could only watch it happen. There was no doubt though, his greatest moment coming in Japan in 1990, when he became champion of the world. And we now join the action on the open roads of Flanders here with Gerrit and Van Drom, the almost by tradition early escapers. They've been out an awful long time. They've had a big lead, but it's now down to 3 minutes and 58 seconds as the climbs approach. And now on the slopes of the Mont Noir and their gap for four minutes now is rapidly starting to come down because this is the critical part of Ghent Wavel game. They go over here, the Mont Noir, and then over towards the Kemmelberg, which they climbed two times. And Rohan Museo, after his victory last weekend in the Tour of Flanders, looking very comfortable. Well, he shouldn't need any more confidence, that's for sure. These two riders, though, have seen a big lead slowly reduce, so they can expect company very shortly. They might get over this climb, but it's unlikely they'll top the Kemmelberg without a lot of bike riders around them. As always, it's springtime here. The Kemmelberg crowded with people awaiting the arrival of the Ghent to Wavelgem race. 
It's always a very difficult race uh, held midweek on a Wednesday between the Tour of Flanders and Paris-Roubaix and it's why very often in the past it's always gone down to a big bunch sprint because the big leaders like Johan Museo and Franco Ballerini they want to keep a little bit of force in their legs because they know that the coming weekend is going to bring them Paris-Roubaix so it gives a chance for some of the lesser riders like the two men we're looking at at the moment to get out and sample just a little bit of glory but once you get into the critical part as we are doing now the speed becomes very high indeed and that's when the breakaway like that their lead starts to crumble and the field now racing towards the narrow roads as they'll swing up uh, onto the cobble climb of the Kemmelberg and uh, not amongst the starters this morning it was last year's winner Philippe Gaumont and so the team leadership of Cofidis uh, today in the hands of Christophe Capel certainly a good man to put your hope in if it does come down to a sprint he won the final stage of the Paris Nice this year out sprinting all of the top sprinters Tom Steele's included a man who took a gold medal in 1996 at the Olympic Games in the French team pursuit squad and also riding for coffee this today Laurent Jalabert's brother Nicolas and if any breakaways go clear that's the sort of man who can look to slip himself into those little moves a nice bit of tempo riding again on this very narrow climb as the two leaders have started the Kemmelberg. 18% at its steepest point and look at the crowd here because there's a little cafe up here once the race goes by they can watch it on television run outside and see it come past again and then the best thing is stay and watch it finish on television because it's a bit congested getting down to the finish from the top of the last climb of the Kemmelberg. Anyway these are the two riders out in front now certainly starting to weaken you can see the difference in the styles when we go back to the main field in a in a few moments just to see just how fast they're going compared to these two leaders Keritz and Van Drom who've been leading the race for an awful long time their maximum lead over eight minutes at one stage but now tumbling very rapidly inside four minutes the most dangerous thing I think about the Kemmelberg though Phil in fact is the descent on the far side because it's a straight descent off the top of this little mountain here in the middle of the Flanders and all you can do is point your bike and hope that it's going to go in a straight line and just shut your eyes I've been down that one uh, Van Drom is now in a little bit of trouble here as Chris Geritz starts to ride away he's on the Flandern 2002 team nice orderly finishing area at the top of the Kemmel here for the riders before they tip down this sheer descent onto smooth roads and thank heavens it's dry today they had a huge crash on this race last year which caused a lot of riders to be taken to hospital here's Keritz as he just this is where he gets steep just here now as he kicks for the summit just as you think it's all over it starts again and Werner van Drommer another Belgian rider out front for a long time but as Paul says they had the big lead the anticipated catchback is now taking place but I did think they'd have been caught by the Kemmelberg and they haven't been done so so they're going to be away for a bit longer this is the first of two circuits this is the easy side of the Kemmelberg the side they're about to descend now is certainly the steepest part as the the leader now Heritz comes up to uh, begin the descent of the Kemmelberg which he will have to face another time and a very stiff circuit around here too because it is slightly windy out there on the course which makes it difficult for these riders who've been leading the race for a very long time and behind the main field will pick up because they will want to ride very much to the front of the climb of the Kemmelberg because this is very often where the decision happens 23 percent descent here is where they go they tip down they slam the brakes on and uh, their eyes are very wide indeed the only good news that I say is it's not raining today so it's just a matter of controlling your bike on the descent but I do know a lot of club cyclists who have been to this area they stand at the top they look down and they refuse to ride the bikes down it is quite a terrifying sight it's good to see Mario Cipollini at the front of the main field putting a bit of pressure on here trying to show a clean pair of wheels to Johan Museo last year Museo was the first man to go over the top here and in fact uh, he's putting a small amount of acceleration in now just to come alongside Super Mario and say hey don't forget I'm the king of the cobbles you might be the king of the sprints <laughs> well in fact the Museo is riding with so much confidence here it storms away up these cobbles this is how he stamped his message on the Mouet de Gramont when he went on to win the Tour de Flanders the other day. And Cipollini, well, one of his wins, by the way, came when they disqualified Jamaluddin Abdu Japarov for irregular sprinting. And I was there on that occasion, and I felt the race referees were a little bit unfair on Abdu Japarov on that occasion. 
Tom Steele's in the Belgian national champions jersey going through there too. A lot of hope, I think, for the Mappé squad on his shoulders this afternoon because, after all, he is one of the top sprinters on the European scene and riding very well with this year with six victories under his belt. There's the clock counting as Johan Museu comes up towards the top of the Kemmelberg first time. It was just over three minutes at the bottom, so in fact they haven't pulled that much back on the climb itself, which is a little bit surprising. But the fast tempo riding to chase down to the climb, uh, they did slice into the lead of the two front runners. But once they go out onto the circuit now, which will take them round over the Monteberg again and the Roderberg, then I think certainly the, the gap of those two leaders will start to come down very dramatically because the main field will pick up an awful lot of speed. This is the start, start of the uh, plunge down over the cobbles out into beautiful wide open Belgian countryside. The roads don't stay flat for too long in this area and they tend to nag a little bit on the legs. But the big professional bunch coming over in something of order which uh, never happens in an amateur race. It's a scrabble for your life as you climb over the Kemmelberg. And there's Museu coming through. He's got a Scrinio rider with him. That's Dario Pieri, who's been riding very well so far this season. He started off his season as well, riding the Tour of Langkawi. and came across to put in a very good performance in the three days of La Pana just a few days ago, which all of these riders move up to Belgium at this time of the year. They ride the Tour of Flanders, they ride the three days of La Pana, Ghent Wevelgem and Paris-Roubaix. So they're very much used to racing against each other over most of the terrain that they're using today. They're all hard and they're all full of cobbles. Now look at the faces of the riders here as they start to prepare for that descent down. They're all a little bit frightened. George Hincapi flashing through our picture there. Had a great ride in the Tour of Flanders. Now this is in fact the leaders are now off the descent and making the right hand turn at the bottom. So this is the main field too. So the head of the field are down safely. And Museo, I think he went away there Paul just to stay out of trouble on that descent certainly did he knows this part of the course and it is a very tricky descent although it's straight in fact you go down there so quickly it seems as if your eyes lose their focus and you just got to hope that once you get onto the tarmac road at the bottom that you in fact have enough reflexes to get around the slight twist to the right hand side so Museo now back in the main field and Dario Pieri was the man who covered him but Pieri has really ridden very well on the Belgian races this year a little bit of a revelation when he won that stage of the Tour de Lancaro and then went on to win the opening stage of the three days of Panna, but always whenever you see Johan Museo there is Wilfred Peters the man that really is his right-hand man Peters is a great competitor when it comes to these Belgian races but certainly devotes a lot of his time to helping Museo it reminds me of the amount of work that Sean Yates used to do for his team leaders like Lance Armstrong when he was on the Motorola squad and Wilfred Peters is equally a great domestic he seems to have the strength that would win him races for himself but instead he gives all of that strength in the service of his team they move smartly up the road here now as we catch up now with the gun rider here and this is Stuart O'Grady well you won't keep him out of the action very long will you and he's now having a little dig himself we're still trying to cross the gap to the two leaders and we haven't seen them for a little while but we presume the gap is coming down I would expect it's coming down pretty dramatically because you can almost feel the difference in the speed. Stuart O'Grady down in quite an aerodynamic position there, using a low gear, just like uh, the track man that he is, a lot of suppleness. And what I think O'Grady will be hoping for is to get some reinforcements from behind because it's around about a 20 kilometer circuit before they actually come back to the Kemmelberg and a lot of open windy roads. Nobody too worried about setting the pace uh, too quickly from the rear of the field here. And now we're back up with the leaders. This is Van Drommer. And he's obviously rejoined the Gerritz on the descent. Gerritz not too willing to push the pace now. I think they know the capture is imminent. They certainly realise how quickly that gap has come down and they've watched uh, Gent Wevelgen behind so many times. In fact, it's come down very dramatically. One minute and 35 seconds to Stuart O'Grady and not too much further back to the main field. So it looks as if uh, it's all going to be over by the shouting for the two leaders and it'll be interesting to see just exactly who comes to the front on this uh, very difficult part of the course. Now the emissaries are being dispatched from the main field now to try and get in contact with the leaders here. It's starting to Mix it just a little bit, Cervais Canavan in the thick of the action again for TVM. This looks like Scott Sunderland, is it? No, 
Oh, it's Andrei Brongiara of Italy. This is where they're trying to break away, but these roads are no longer flat. In fact, they feel so heavy on the legs. And this looks as though Dirksen's, or Dirksen's also come across the Bragap areas. Number 172, De Meester, Brongiara and Canavan. That's the little four-man breakaway that's trying to get itself established here. They're in pursuit of Stuart O'Grady, who is in turn in pursuit of Gerritz and Van Drommer. Ludo Dirksen getting just onto the back of that group. He had a very good season so far, but doing an awful lot of work for his team leader, Andre Schmiel. And that's the point that Stuart O'Grady, I think, has been waiting for. He's got reinforcements from behind, so he's now in a very good group of what will be seven riders. And what we could call a bunch of opportunists here, rather than race favourites, perhaps. But they've only got the two uh, lesser lights out front who are slowly making a name for themselves as this group has now come together. The Festina rider just notching onto the back there. Uh, that was De Meister. And there's the full list of the riders in this breakaway now. In fact, they're wrong about Pluinek, number 17. They've misread his number. It's number 77, Fabio Sacchi of the Palti team, who has made that escape. No mistaking this man surveys Carnarvon, keeping himself topped up with energy. That drink is a drink called Extran, very high in carbohydrates that a lot of these riders tend to use and try and keep their levels right up there, especially in a race like this. Now next up, the tarmac climb of the Rudderberg. And a much better workmanlike group here now. Now, you see, we're catching a race here which is bridging between Flanders and Roubaix. And it could be the day that the big lights have decided they don't want to make the big effort and this breakaway might go. And then again, it might not pull because it looks as though the bunch is split into fragments here. So whatever has happened since they come off the top of the Kennelberg, the wind must have changed direction. And it's torn this group into four bunches at the front. So disregard that piece of comedy. It looks as though we could have a group coming together here. Certainly does. That's the important thing about riding a race like Game Wevelgem. And not only do you have the strategic point of all these climbs at about 60 kilometers from the finish line, but also this part of Belgium is very windy indeed. And that is exactly what happens once you come off the climb of Kemmelberg. You go out onto these open farm roads and the wind just splits the race into pieces. Well, there's De Meister going through, followed by Saki. steady workman group but in fact they're not running away with this they're not putting their backs in it because they know that there will be more decisions to be made on the circuit that they're on now it's a tough undulating circuit uh, taking them over the Rodeberg and the Monteberg and the Kemmelberg for the last time and it's whoever is in good striking distance to the front over the top of the Kemmelberg that you race for home very difficult though because from the top of the camel boat the last time there's 44 kilometers to go to the finish which is why very often the race like this has always come down to a race for the sprinters which is why we're seeing men like Mario Cipollini taking all kinds of risks to get over the Kemmelberg in the first part of the main field because they're hoping that a group of 50 or 60 riders comes down the big main street in Wavelgem because then we will be treated to a royal sprint finish because this race over the last few years certainly has been a race for the sprinters very shortly we're going to have quite a few riders together at the front general regrouping I think this bunch far from out of touch here the Cannondale boys Seiko Cannondale trying to pull Cipollini back into the fray and this road not conducive now for a good attack because each group can see one another as they start to race across the gaps certainly can we've now got uh, 58 kilometers to go before the finish line 150 kilometers covered since the start and the riders coming into the small town of Renninghelst and once they come through there they will then tip upwards towards the top of the Zwarteberg or the Mont Noir one more time before then going over the Rodeberg and heading back down to Monteberg and Kemmelberg once again and this is now the head of the race here and the Mappe boys are getting themselves into the picture as well. well. Certainly not thinking about a victory for Johan Museo today. More likely they're trying to make sure that they can bring it all back together for their man Tom Steeles because so far this season he's had seven victories in the sprints around uh, many of the races in Europe including some in Paris-Nice where he really was a dominant participant when it came down to the flatter stages. Stuart O'Grady there giving us yet another um, demonstration of it, the amount of work he puts in at the front 
Now the two leaders, the last two survivors are still hanging on. 45 seconds is all of the gap they've got now. Uh, but they're obviously not just hanging about out there, they're running a very good race indeed, those two youngsters. They certainly are, but I'm, I'm fairly confident now that by the time they get to Kemmelberg for the final time, they'll be swept up by the main field. In fact, information coming that Eric Zabel is still in this leading group of riders as well. So uh, all the top sprinters of Europe going out and looking today, I think, to a very good showdown. Zabel, Cipollini and Tom Steeles, that could uh, be the recipe for a very exciting sprint down the main street. Well, as it has been in the past indeed in Webbledon, but on the other hand, it's... Uh for my mind it is not a sprinters race anymore but we'll see it depends on the teams whether they've got good sprinters they want to defend for or whether they want to gamble with their, their opportunists on the squad certainly at the front of that group at the moment it's uh, the red jerseys of Seiko Cannondale and the pink jerseys of uh, Telecom looking to try and control affairs and keep it all together because they want their men in with a chance but the most important thing as you said though is to get over the Kemmelberg because that is a very difficult climb and if you don't judge it rightly a group of 30 or 40 riders can get clear and race all the way to the finish as they did last year and cheat a lot of the sprinters out of their chance for glory well, there's Seiko, closed down the first gap in the field as the boys at the front are just trying to split it up again here. Chance to see just over the fields there, the Kemmelberg, which is what the riders are going to circumnavigate before they come back and climb up it for the second time here. This is Hans de Meester trying to leap off the front and make sure that he's the first man to join those two leaders and their time gap now must certainly be disintegrating. He's finding nobody wanting to take him up at all, so De Meester may as well sit up and let the race come back to him. And there's the field now, and there down below I think are the two leaders, so they've reeled them in. There's still an awful lot of riders left in gemp Wevelgum at the moment. Here's Van Drommer, and behind him is Chris Geritz. Both looking very tired now very slight incline here for the riders well they're saying it's 45 seconds but it looks to me as though it's almost over I think it is almost over those two men have probably picked up uh, a few dollars along the way because there are special prizes along the route of game wave game and there was a big prize for the first man to go across the top of uh, the Kemmelberg there but that's an interesting move because that's Wilfred Peters leaping out of the front of that group and joining him there was his own teammate Tom Steele so Peters obviously trying to encourage Tom Steele to look for these little gaps and try and pull himself across and there are the two leaders now so it looks very much Phil as if the race is all together and there's just one little gap behind this group here with Peters coming across it but I think you're right I think it's all going to stay together now and there's our oh, Peters has got Tom Steele's on but there's a quite a scurrying of riders now the Lotto boys are across again thinking of their evergreen Andre Schmil and the race as you say Paul is definitely all together the only riders not here now are trailing somewhere around the sag wagon but a long day of racing by those two breakaway riders uh, now put them back in the field Chris Pierce here riding for Lotto trying to keep the pace high and right behind him Nico Matin another Mappe rider very good friend of Frank van den Broeke a former champion of Belgium in the time trial and certainly well integrated now into the Mappe squad all of these riders feel that they put enough pressure on to split the main field but looking over the shoulders they can see there's still an awful lot of riders left and there's still a lot of riders willing to have a go here. Palti have gone out on the tack again. Cofferdies feeling perhaps this race is theirs, offering a little bit of a counter-attack. Laurent Debien, local rider, lives just across the border in Roubaix. He's hoping to try and uh, surprise everybody. And he knows this area very well, spends a lot of time training on these roads. Now this is the town here of Renninghelst. And these riders will pick their way through here. And once they get to the end of the town, they'll turn left. And they have a very difficult climb known as the Mont Noir or the Zwarteberg, the Black Mountain. And that is where a good move could come. And that's the start of a series of them finishing with the Kemmelberg. 153 kilometers gone now, so the best part of 100 miles in the legs. It's been a very active bunch, but again, as we saw in Het Volk and as we saw in the Tour of Flanders, they haven't found yet too many riders can get away from the comfort of the big peloton. Small split starting to appear in the main field here, but I think once the road tilts up just to the summit of this climb, then there'll be a general regrouping from behind. Here's Brian Home, 
and uh, rumours starting to run a little bit rife that uh, Brian Home is not too happy with the Jack and Jones team. There seems to be a bit of a fallout with the Danish riders. They've all been brought together on this new squad to represent Danish cycling across the European circuit, but there's been one or two little discussions between Brian Home and the rest of the management, so hopefully they'll be able to sort that out. As Brian Home, uh, a great professional over the last few years, rode for many seasons on Team Telecom with Jan Ulrich and Eric Zabel at the Tour de France, but now representing his own country in the Jack and Jones squad. So as Holmes uh, goes back into the bunch there, we've still got these two riders trying to go. I think it's still Long Debian trying to get clear. Now the Seiko team trying to liven it up, and they're all starting to have a little dash at the climb now as he starts to bite into the legs. Magnus Backstead on the front for Gann there, trying to encourage somebody from his team. And it looked like Frank Vandenbroek trying to go across there. Now Vandenbroek knows these roads very well indeed. He lives about seven kilometres from here in the town of Plugstair, where his dad has a small cafe uh, right on the corner in the centre of town. There it is, wearing number eight, Frank Vandenbroek. He's obviously been sent out there by Tom Steeles and Johan Museo to cover these little moves on the very tiny little roads of the Herverland, which this area is called. Snappy little climb, best part of a kilometre now, the Rudeberg, the Red Mountain. And still Laurent Debien holding on to a very slender lead over the rest of the main field here. And on his wheel, the Pulte rider is Christian Salvato. Coming across in a group of four or five riders is Frank Vandenbroek. So he certainly has been very attentive and he's got the power after that victory of his in Paris-Nice earlier this month. He's shown that he is really moving up to the top of international cycling with uh, a victory in Paris-Nice at the age of 23. I think that really does show that he certainly will be a man for the future. Reminds us of the early days of Jacques Anquetil who won Paris-Nice five times. So everybody who's saying that Frank Vandenbroek is a star of the future could well be right. Two second places on two stages in last year's Tour de France, which upset him because he wanted the wins, of course. Uh, but he's continuing now uh, to develop into a very good bike rider indeed. He certainly is. This is Magnus Backstead, four times champion of uh, his own country at the time trial. A very strong rider and I think a great asset for the GAN squad who've tried to strengthen their ranks this year. But it's amazing that Roger Leger has uh, always been the manager of this French team, but he always seems to pull in a lot of foreign riders. I don't know if he uh, maybe has much more confidence in the English speaking and the Scandinavian riders. You could be right, but he's certainly been a great ally to the British riders like Chris Borman and making sure they get on the team and uh, Hank Vogel, Stuart O'Grady and Scott Sunderland was there briefly, he's now moved on to a Belgian squad this year. This is the composition then at the breakaway, Van der Broek, uh, Debian, Lefebvre, Salvato, Petito. Now this is a very good move indeed, especially with the like of Van der Broek in here because that means the Mappe team are going to shut down at the back now. Well, Frank's going to be very happy with that. This is the Roderberg. If you climb up here, just on the right-hand side, there's a very nice little windmill where you can go for coffee. But you can see just at the top, it climbs up at 13%. But it's not a very long climb. Then it plunges down from here into the town of Loka. And very shortly after that, the Monteberg. In fact, Vandenbroek seems to be having a certain amount of difficulty staying on the wheel of Laurent Debian, who's riding like a man possessed this afternoon. He wants to get away because he's looking to try and give Cofidis a good win. They've had a win so far this year with... Uh, Francesco Casagrande winning the opening stage of the Tour of the Mediterranean but Debian is riding a, a little bit of a crazy move there because he was in a nice group of five riders and he should try and keep it together because that's the only way to try and survive to the finish because we're still 30 miles from the finish line in Wavelgem. Well, it doesn't sound very far but unfortunately they've got the climbs to go over before they get down to the Wavelgem finish but the pressure has been on now for probably the best part of 30 minutes here and they're announcing that Chris Gerritz has now given up the race having been caught after that long breakaway and he's been followed by his breakaway partner Van Drommer as well so they're, they've gone from the front to the sag wagon in one fluid movement 
Well, that was uh, to be expected. It's a very difficult race to stay out in front of for so long. They did build up a maximum lead, one time over eight minutes. But once the big machine of the main field starts to kick in, it certainly can eat into those breakaways advantages very quickly. But in the main field, Phil, there's a lot of speed coming up now. And it's the turn of the Lotto squad at the front trying to pull it all back together. Now, their top sprinter, uh, Joe Plankart, he's been out of circulation for most of this season now after winning the uh, Etoile de Bessege in February. In fact, had to undergo knee surgery. So for them, it really is a blow to their morale when it comes to races like this because Joe Plankart was developing into a very good sprinter. Yes, and the news is he could be out for the best part of all the season, but let's hope he recovers quickly, part of the famous Plankart family. Now the field coming down. We'll have to watch the corner there too as they come around that centre reservation. But Vandenbroek's little group now has 17 seconds, which wouldn't be a lot, except that there's some good riders in this group. Clearly, we have an inspired Laurent Debian for the Cofidis team. His team, don't forget, won this race last year with Philippe Gaumont. Uh, Vandenbroek himself is on the strong Mappe team, and that uh, means a lot of protection will be going on behind. But there's not a lot of love lost between him and the Lotto squad. That's probably why they're riding so hard at the front at the moment. He turned professional for Lotto in 1994. And in fact, was supposed to ride for them the following year, but he fell out with his uncle, the team manager, Jean-Luc, and halfway through the season swapped over to come and ride for Mappé. So uh, that could well be why we've got so many Lotto riders at the front riding so hard. Well, you're right, but little Frank, he may be only 23 years of age, but he's quite mature when it comes to deciding his future. And he doesn't take fools lightly. And I think if, uh, if Mappé don't make a decision very quickly as to their future in the sport, he'll have already signed a contract for next year with somebody else. A big rumour on the uh, streets of Belgium at the moment, in fact, that he's uh, probably going to go and ride for Coffee Dish next year if they can't come up with some kind of a decision. But I think if Mappé does make the decision to stay in the sport, he would be much more intelligent to stay there because he does have the backing of a very strong squad. Yes, uh, and everybody gets a turn to win, not least Van der Broek, who's had a great start to the season, leading uh, Paris right through the whole week. Debian setting the pace at the moment. The gap uh, reducing slightly here. Lars Mikkelsen also in this break now. The Dane who won this race a couple of years ago. He certainly did. That was a very close finish there with Maurizio Fondrius. Nobody knew the name of Lars Mikkelsen when it came up to the finish line there. It was almost a hair's breadth, but he was the man to push his bike over the line in first position. The main field doesn't look as if it's going too fast at the moment, but <laughs> there's a lot of lotto riders on the front. I think the whole team is up there right now, and the man not doing any of the work is Andre Schmil. They're keeping him for later, but everybody else is driving this group along now. It's the amazing thing about uh, Andre Schmil. Normally he's regarded as a one-day man for the tough races like the Tour of Flanders and even Paris-Roubaix, which is in a couple of days' time. But when it comes to the big sprints, he always manages to get himself in the first four or five. So uh, that's probably why the Lotto boys have come to the front to try and close it down, because they're not represented in that leading group of eight riders. And uh, they will obviously be uh, smarting a little bit by the fact that uh, little Frank is up there as well, because all of Belgium at this moment is talking about Frank van den Broek and Lotto, in fact, really is the national team. Well, it looks as though the Mappe team are coming up as well now. I don't quite know why they're chasing down, but it's not much of an advantage for Van Vandenbroek as they rip across the town centre here. And it could well be that either a couple of riders will reach this breakaway or they will bring it back. Well, if the, lot, if the Mappe boys went to the front there, they obviously don't have a lot of confidence in Vandenbroek's ability to win from a small group like this. And he looks over his shoulder and he's not going to be very happy to see all those Mappe jerseys on the front of the main field. Carlo Bowman's in there for the Pullman squad as well. So it must be that they want to bring it all back together for Tom Steeles. And uh, Vandenbroek obviously uh, will surely have a few words to say with his teammates about that because normally if you have a man in the break, you shouldn't send the team up to chase them down. But... They must feel that Steeles is the fastest man on the block, which is why they're starting to close it down. Well, just for the moment, somebody's put the brakes on. The peloton is completely fattened out. So it may go away again. Very often it does. The answer is if you're in a breakaway, don't give up till you feel the, the hot air of the peloton around you because very often they can almost touch you and for no apparent reason stop chasing and you're on your way again. Moving up into sixth position there, the very large figure of Franco Ballerini. And in second spot, that's Henk Vogels, 
he'd be looking for a good sprint. He finished well up to the front in uh, Game Wevo Game last year. I think he took sixth place in that mad dash for the line. And his own teammate Stuart O'Grady was in the top ten as well on that day. So those two Aussies know exactly how to finish off a race like this. And maybe finish off the break as well because it does look as though they are going to wind it in. The breakaway still hanging on. Tough little climb this, the climb of the Monteberg. It doesn't seem like much, but it just seems to go on and on. And once you get over the top, you don't have very much time to recuperate before you hit that left-hand turn, which takes you up the Mont, the Mont Camel. Salvato is the rider setting the pace at the moment. The gap, if anything, may have stretched just a little bit through the trees there. Certainly has, I think, uh, probably stretched out to around about 20 seconds. And nobody's chasing, but somebody's definitely trying to come He's across. He's taken a real fly here, and it looks as though it's Cofidis again that's gone across. In fact, it's one of the riders from Scrigno jumping across oh. there. That's probably uh, Pieri, Dario Pieri, because he certainly is the kind of rider to look for this move. But Vandenbroek's decided now's the time for him to go. Now, that's a brave move, because there's still a very long way to go. And it is Dario Pieri. In fact, he jumped across from the main field. He called the group, and now he's going across to Vandenbroek. Well, that was an inspired piece of cycling there. We hardly saw him latch on as the camera came down from the helicopter to the road. They've all given up in this breakaway. They decided to allow them to come back up. And Vandenbroek has realized it's now or never. He's gone. Now, will he wait for Pieri to try and give him a little bit of a leg up towards the Kemmelberg? More counterattacks flying off the front of the bunch now. Laurent Lefebvre from the Festina team trying to rip up there. Followed by Laurent uh, Debian as well. So all of the Laurents trying to get across there. This is Petito for Seiko coming across. Lars Mikkelsen and they still have a slight advantage. Stuart O'Grady there and then just sitting on the back the former Belgian national champion Carlo Bowmans, the leader of the Pullman squad on which Scott Sunderland rides for. And Scott Sunderland had a fantastic ride last weekend in the Tour of Flanders finishing 11th when he went across the ride, a line. A good ride by him there but uh, still felt the main field not letting anybody get too far clear. Well, this is a very pretty part of Belgium as we run right close to the French borders now and uh, Vandenbroek trying to land himself a classic victory here. This road will continue to climb as he swings up onto the Kemmelberg. We're getting rather familiar sights of the Mappe boys doing these lone breaks, especially after Museo won the Tour of Flanders. Attacking at a similar point, there's the turn into the Kemmelberg. Certainly everybody out there shouting for Frank Vandenbroek. Everybody knows him in this area. His father has that little cafe not too far away from here. But something not a lot of people knew about Frank Vandenbroek. In fact, as, uh, as a junior, he was in fact the cross-country champion of Belgium on a very muddy day in Plugstedt. He actually managed to win that cross-country title. And uh, a very interesting performance by him because he's then been kept away from cycling by his father, who himself was a, a top amateur rider with 300 victories to his credit. But always he was in the shadow of his uncle, Jean-Luc Vandenbroek, because everybody in Belgium talked about Jean-Luc being the next Eddie Merckx. And they tried to discourage Frank from taking up cycling because they figured it would be too much pressure. But it's a decision he came up with himself. And having already been champion of Belgium in the cross country, he's decided now that he wants to be a successful bike rider. And today he's riding him very successfully up the camel. You see just how difficult it was for Pieri to get onto his wheel. Yeah, look at this Stuart O'Grady now driving the chase group up as well. The main field is latched on to the back of them even so. Debian goes through, Lars Mikkelsen, but here comes the group now. Johan Museo is right up there too. So is Franco Ballerini, Henk Vogels and Frederic Moncassin. In fact, Dario Pieri has caught Vandenbroek and gone by him. Now this man certainly to me, Phil, has been a great revelation of the season so far. He's done a great performance coming up after the Tour of Lankawi stage victory that he got there and really ridden well. Now you can see Stuart O'Grady coming up. O'Grady really at home on these Belgian races and trying to come across now as well is uh, Jean-Luc Bortolami. But in the main field, an awful lot of Mappe jerseys. There in the middle is Frédéric Moncassin and the man that uh, Seiko is looking for, Frank Mario Cipollini, coming through quite comfortably too. There's Surveys Carnarvon. 
a lot of these riders are trying to survive, trying to keep themselves at the front. There's Sven Tutenberg for the US Postal Service, so if it does come down to a sprint, he still has a very good chance of getting a victory. But all of the main contenders still in at the kill at the moment. There's no real decisions being made so far in this year's Ghent Wavel game because I think the winds haven't been as strong as they normally are when they go up along the coast there. And all that's happened for the moment is Frank Vandenbroek has managed to steal a small advantage over the rest of the field. Well, one piece of good news is, although we've had bad weather in Belgium, the rain has stayed away on the big race days. And again, conditions quite dry here now. Now, can Vandenbroek make something of this? Pieri is right with him once more. This is the difficult stretch of the descent. They're almost off it, in fact. But there's a real chance now for Vandenbroek. This is the sort of move he will like. And, uh, well, we don't know too much about Pieri, but he's obviously got good form this year. They've been latched on, there's three, four, five riders coming together now. This could be a very, very useful escape indeed. It looks as though Debian has got himself back up there. And Stuart O'Grady managed to pop across as well there, but it looks as if the whole of the main field is just a little bit fractioned off the front there, but I think it may well be that uh, Vandenbroek's escape there is about to be doomed because most of those riders are very close behind, and I think with 44 kilometres remaining, it should all come back together. Well, this is where they have almost by tradition the reorganizing section of the course after the descent of the Kemmel. But now there's no more climbs of the Kemmel to come, so it's time to get on and push home what advantage you've gained here. Van der Broek is latched on to the back with Debia. Looks to be about eight to nine, maybe ten riders are getting themselves clear at the moment. Riders coming up one at a time there. I thought I saw the shape of Franco Ballerini coming across there as well with uh, Bruno Boscardin from the Festina squad. And a little bit further back, another very large group of riders starting to form. You see, the second time over the Camel really has caused a bit of devastation in the field because uh, there are several groups now, and if they get themselves organized, they should be able to pull it all back together. But all of this is because of the pressure of the chase we pay behind Frank Vandenbroek. Well, we'll catch up the composition of the group. Oh, here it comes. Ballerini is headed up. You're absolutely right. Van der Broek is still there. He started it all, really, along with Pieri. Bowman's has got back in. Petito, Mikkelsen, O'Grady. It's a very strong group now. It's just the sort of group that could well stay away to the finish here. You certainly need a big group to try and succeed going down to the uh, the finish line in Wavell game because there's still an awful lot of very long, very straight rows. But in fact, there's a group just coming across as well there, so that's going to swell it to around about 30 men and the rest of the main field not too far behind. That's Mikkelsen on the right of our picture. Had victory here once before and now would love it again, of course, just to reconfirm his return to the top line of the sport. Nice split now because the bunch has basically reformed after the chase down from the Kemmelberg. Now they've got to find themselves some leaders to try and hunt down that breakaway. You certainly will. This is very similar to the situation last year when the group got away just after the Kemmelberg. About 20 riders managed to get off the front and the big loser on that day was Eric Zabel. But information coming to us today, in fact, that Eric Zabel has managed to get across the gap and he's in this leading group of riders which is estimated to be 33 members. And uh, also he's got a great teammate in there as well because Giovanni Lombardi from Telecom is in the move as well. Former Olympic champion on the track and a very good sprinter indeed. Now a lot of guys looking at one another here, there's an attack by O'Grady, comes right up on the television camera and then swings into the action, so it looks as though they're going to have a resort here at the front. There's a number of riders want to go forward and there's a number of riders don't want to do anything at all, so they're feeling a little bit tired just now. And that was Frédéric Guédon from the Française des Jeux after his breakaway in the Tour of Flanders just a few days ago. He too has still got pretty good legs coming up to Paris-Roubaix in a few days' time. But obviously, whenever the pace slows down, Stuart O'Grady just wants to launch himself off the front. And the Festina rider there just uh, closing it down on him, I think, was Bruno Boscardin. Started life off as an Italian, but has now changed his nationality to, uh, to ride for Switzerland. Well, they're saying that Peloton's got 33 riders in it right now. Cipollini going through there, followed by Eric Zabel. Giovanni Lombardi, so a lot of the top sprinters paying a lot of attention here. There's uh, Johan Museo going through as well, and his own teammate Franco Ballerini. So uh, a lot of riders from Mapei in this squad, because also Nico Matin is there, 
and obviously the man who started it all coming into the frame right now, Frank Vandenbroek. One or two of the sprinters up here now, Baldato is here, so too is Cipollini. The Lombardi and Zabel all can sprint. Blyleavens as well, Peter van Pietergemt, Scott Sunderland once again making the move. There is Rolf Sorensen, Frederic Moncassin, Fabio Baldato, so not very many of the top sprinters have missed out on this move field, so uh, looking like a very good composition for the moment. Well, they've done well actually because there are no more hills of note now, so in theory they should take this race down to the finishing line and have a battle to themselves, but uh, I'm not too sure because this long running does lead a lot of opportunity for riders to get off the front and then hope their teammates can do a little bit of disrupting at the back. Fly Levens is the man that a lot of riders thought had a great chance of victory this morning. It's going to be uh, a great sprint victory if all of this uh, stays together because two men at the top of the, the, the winning board so far this season are Eric Zabel with, seven, with six victories so far and Tom Steeles with six victories so far this season. But a lot of people feel that the, the fastest pure sprinter is your own Bly Levens. It's maturing, there's a big bike rider now. A couple of stage wins in the Tour de France, but uh, maybe this year he'll help himself to one or two more. 40 seconds now to Vandenbroek's group. The legs there of Andrea Tappi, number five. Number 93 passing through is Petito. He'll be thinking no doubt of a good performance in the upcoming Tour of Italy this year. He always plays a, a pretty prominent part in that event. It certainly does, and uh, Ivan Gotti, last year's winner of the Tour of Italy, who rides for the Seiko Cannondale team, had a very quiet start to the season this year, but certainly was a, a great uh, introduction to the sport of uh, professional road cycling for Cannondale, with uh, Mario Cipollini winning the points jersey, uh, Ivan Gotti winning the overall uh, pink jersey at the end of the Tour of Italy, and the performances of uh, Cipollini when it came to the Tour de France, I think they had to be uh, quite happy with their introduction into the sport. They certainly... Uh go a long way to improve on it. Now there's the little escape group. And the field uh, more or less all together. It's a big breakaway this, the average speed. Well it's quite slow really, 37.5 kilometres an hour. I know we've had a few hills but normally uh, on this sort of course we'd expect it to be just a little bit quicker. So the wind has been troublesome today. There's still quite a bit of speed in the main field but it makes you wonder who exactly is going to be the team to organize the chase behind because a lot of the top men have managed to get themselves into this group and the only man who appears to be missing at the moment in fact is Andre Schmiel and any, any, anybody from the Lotto squad. Well that's true, we haven't seen Schmiel at all. He must be in that chase group there with the Lotto boys working pretty hard as Seiko are now beginning to spearhead the front of this race here. Certainly are. I think they have a lot of confidence because Mario Cipollini is very comfortably in this league group and they're getting some help as well from the uh, pink jerseys of Deutsches Telekom because their man Eric Zabel certainly has been a pro prolific winner so far this season. The gap not really starting to open up at the moment, still hovering around the 45 second mark as Bruno Boscadin comes to the front to try and make sure that he can open up the gap over the rest of the chasers. Well, with the camel on their backs now, the riders racing towards Wavelgum. As the kilometres tick off, they're going to feel pretty confident of success here because the main chase is not full on yet. Uh, Hank Vogel shaking his head here. He's got a problem, I think. Difficult to see exactly what his problem was there as we get a chance here to look at 113. Dario Pieri, one of the first men to start this move with Frank Vandenbroek and his teammate there just sitting behind him. 115 is Gabriel Balducci. Sunderland and uh, at the back here it's going to be difficult for Hank Vogels if he has a serious problem to get uh, any help from his team car because the gap is not yet big enough for the team managers to come in it has to be legally one minute before team managers can come in to help out uh, there is a, a neutral service car behind there but it may well be something a little bit more specific to his own team car that he requires well there more or less you can see the gap now it looks to be around about 40 seconds if that so they're not going to exactly fly out of sight here and while on these long straight roads which do hang around for a while now they could well organize a chase down here the only advantage I suppose is a lot of teams have got riders in this front group a 
and a lot of teams have got the right riders. The big teams have all got the men they want present in this leading group of riders here, so they must be happy with the makeup, which then makes you wonder just exactly who has got the power to drive behind, because TVM have got their man up there, your own Blyleve and Seiko must be pretty happy with Mario Cipollini, and of course, the one big sprinter missing is Tom Steeles, but Mappe, I think with four men up there, they must feel quite confident, because when given his chance, Johan Museo still does know how to win some pretty good bunch sprints. It's over 40 seconds and it is officially, so they can't see them, and it's not too far at all. It's the first sprinkling of Italian team riders up here as well. They won't want to take it down to the sprint, with the exception of that Cipollini and one or two others. There's Vogels and O'Grady having a chat. Friends and teammates, they often turn up in the same breaks together. Frederick Guedon wearing number 43, the winner of uh, last year's Paris-Roubaix. And Peter van Pietigem, who's becoming somewhat of a local favourite in Belgium, and Big Mario himself. Well, he's had a great start of the season, but now a counter-attack going right from the centre of the bunch. And is this Frank van der Broek again? That's his, that's his best mate, actually. It's Nico Matin wearing number seven. These two riders very closely alike. They really get on well together. They spend a lot of time socialising, not only racing on the same team. So Matin has gone out to the front there, and Boscardin is the man jumping out after him. So this might well alter the whole complexion now because the main field will within three quarters of a minute but once the counter-attack start uh, this could immediately pull this on away. There's Frank van der Broek actually uh, still in the line. He's probably quite well aware that Nico has attacked because he came from down the body of the escape and there you see them both up front at the moment with Bruno Boscadin and Nico Matin. Somebody is streaking across the gap to join them and our camera won't be too far away so we'll pick that up very shortly it's a very clever move by Mappe there because they're obviously now starting to worry just a little bit by the number of top sprinters in this group which is why they're trying to launch their men off the front in fact number 181 is our old friend Carlo Bowman so he's being attentive too he probably feels that this afternoon because there are so many sprinters in that group behind that you've got a great chance of getting clear Vandenbroek coming to the front trying to discourage any counter-attacks because he certainly would be very happy for his own teammate there Nico Matin to steal away just a few more seconds it's Mario Shidia with Seiko setting the pace up now. Nico is looking for, hoping for, probably a free lift up to the leaders because he can't exactly chase down his mate uh, Martin. Carlo Bowman's sort of past the best of his career now as he starts to pass through the second division teams into retirement. But even so, this man is such a good bike rider and his experience and knowledge, he reads races very well indeed. Certainly counts for a lot when you ride a race like Gent Wavel Gem. Telecom also sending a man up to the front here, wearing number 133, the new rider on Team Telecom this year, Jan Shafrath. Certainly have strengthened up the squad, looking forward to what they hope will be a very good Tour de France later in the season. Eric Zab will be sitting somewhere down the line there, trying to keep out of the out of the wind, shelter, waiting till he gets down to the last two or three hundred meters because then that's when he will unleash that incredible sprint of his. But a big reaction behind Phil Seiko, obviously want to keep it all together and the Team Telecom 2 have sent a couple of men up there so it doesn't look as if this leading group of three rides is going to go too far up the road. Well maybe we're being treated to a chase down by Seiko, thinking of Cipollini who's had a win already this year but not as prolific as he often is at this time of the year. But the Seiko boys getting ready also for the tour of Italy when they'll hope they'll be pacing Cipollini to one or two stage wins as per usual. Well, Cipollini hasn't been quite as successful as he normally is at this time of the season. In fact, only two victories under his belt so far. And your own Bly label to a man who everybody feels is a big favourite for the win today if it can come down to a big sprint, sprint when we come into Wavell game has only won three against six for Zabel and six for Tom Steeles and Tom Steeles uh, obviously letting down the Mappe squad a little bit by missing a huge group like this because uh, we're being told that there are 33 riders in this group at the moment so to miss a group like that uh, there really must have been something wrong with Steeles before the start. Yes, yeah, so he just uh, put in one appearance in this race when he bridged across the gap on the last lap and then he disappeared out of the fray altogether. And Schaffrath in second place here, newcomer on the block. Part of the uh, top class German amateur team until this year. Just see how fast it is now that 
that front group is one very long line indeed because the hammer has been put down by the Saeco team. Not one of those riders in the team thinking about anything else but getting it all back together for Mario Cipollini because Chippo, when it comes down to a big sprint like this at the end of Game Wavel Game for a semi classic, certainly knows how to unleash a, a real turn of speed. But they've still got to catch the three breakaways before it be any use at all to him. He knows that, he'll sit back and just hope the boys do a good job. Portolami managed to get himself across to that group with Matin and Carlo Bowmans, but in fact the gap has come down pretty dramatically there, so surely these three riders will get pulled back into the fold. And then we might see a counter-attack coming from uh, Ballerini or Museo, because I think the reason that Matin went out on the attack here is because they don't feel confident that they can win if it comes down to the sprint, so they may well try and force a small group to get clear. Well, it doesn't seem a lot of help coming back but, uh, for the Seiko riders, although the gap is closing down. It's just about 26 kilometers to go now, 15, 16 miles from the finish. Still a lot of time to reshape this race even now. Yes, those uh, Seiko boys put in a fair turn of speed as they came around the corner there, and I think everybody behind them was gasping for breath. And pretty shortly they'll have the three leaders back in the fold. And sitting very comfortably there in fourth position is Frank Vandenbroek, just hoping, I think, that his uh, old mate Nico Matin can hold on just a little bit longer. But once we get to the end of this section of road, we actually come out onto the very big main road from Ypres down into Wavelgem, and that is where it's so difficult to stay clear, and it looks as if it's almost all over for the three leaders. Well, it looks as though uh, Mario Siria has just crossed the gap by himself here with Seiko, and latched onto the back of the breakaway. Then comes the rest of it, uh, Shafath comes on and followed by Petito. So the race is all together again and still everything to race for here is quite a big bunch has formed once more at the front. And soon they'll be out of these back roads and down to the highways. Still the gap hasn't gone up to that one minute mark because there's only one neutral service car behind this leading group of riders and uh, the main field must still be hovering just a little bit further down in the distance and I would think that will be the in fact information is that it is one minute the gap now and obviously the big loser this afternoon is Andre Schmiel and I'm sure that anybody riding at the front of that group behind must have a lot of jersey on. Well, we haven't had a chance to really get down alongside this break and nail every one of the riders in it but nobody's seen a sight of a lotto jersey yet. Immediately the capture's taken place, it is again the Seiko boys who have taken over the pacemaking at the front. They're even having a chat about it here. The Tito's turn at the front now, these are the legs of uh, Shafrath. He's settling into the pro scene pretty quickly. He certainly is, and a great team to, to serve your apprenticeship out on a team like the telecom squad because they've got such a great chance of victories when it comes down to events like this with Eric Zabel who is somewhere sitting in the back there waiting for the, the moment when he can unleash his killer sprint just keeping an eye probably on Jerome Blylevens the other rapid man in this race this afternoon Jerome Blylevens won a stage victory in the Tour de France last year and certainly is a very quick man when it comes down to the final few meters of a race like this and it does seem in international cycling that a lot more sprinters are starting to come into the sport again there was a time when sprinters really didn't have the chance the races were dominated by so many breakaways but now it seems with teams like Seiko Cannondale just basing their whole tactics on keeping races together for their man Mario Cipollini to win well maybe they're turning get way we're going back into a sprinters classy again and the hills They've managed to even out just that little bit, which you can often do if you've got a strong team about you, because you can just close the race down once the hills have gone by. And it is certainly an awful long way to the finish line from the top of the Camelberg the last time. 44 kilometers, about 27 miles, which is probably what the tactic was this afternoon of Seiko, just to let small groups go clear. They let Frank Vandenbroek attack on the slopes of the Kemmel there, knowing full well that once it came to the big long run into the finish, as long as Mario Cipollini was with them, then they could pick up the pace and start to close it down. Well, as our camera slips down the line here, there's a lot of jersey. Oh yes, there is one. One lot of rider is in the break. It wasn't Andre Schmuel though. Back on the front now. And these 
these guys are looking pretty relaxed considering they've been under pressure. There's an abundance of Mape jerseys here now. There's the big man himself, Cipollini. Everybody getting a chance to talk a few tactics there. There's your own Blyleven's coming through. Peter van Pietigem having a quick word with uh, Franco Ballerini. And sporting the beard, Fabio Baldato, a great sprinter in his time. And there is Eric Zabel. Looks very comfortable, very easy. He's got a great lead out man if it comes down to the final sprint with Giovanni Lombardi, a great track sprinter. Ridden a lot of six days during the winter this season and getting himself now ready for a long road season. Alongside Derek Zabel, he certainly was extremely happy when Zabel took out the sprint victory in Milan San Remo to win the first round of the World Cup. Well, the, the distance is coming down, but they're going to have to again rethink how they're going to win this one. There's a lot of guys in here looking a bit fresh just at the moment. Just two riders from Saiko Cannondale doing all the work on the front. They're getting a little bit of help from the rider from Deutsches Telekom, but it's a lot of work to do, considering there's about 30 passengers in this group now waiting for some opportunity to attack. And that's uh, one thing that Seiko have had to do now is make sure that they can control the race. That's how the race has unfolded over the last few years. 1988 went to Sean Kelly, and 1989, Kerrit Solovelt won ahead of my friend Sean Yates. And so far, Tom Steeles, who won two years ago and was second last year, we haven't seen Haydn heard of him this time around. Philippe Gaumont was the one that pinched the sprint last time out. I think he caught everybody unawares there. In I fact, the uh, live camera at the finish went to the wrong man. He thought Johan Capio had won, and there wasn't uh, a cameraman in sight around the Frenchman. Mario Cipollini looking very comfortable. Shaved his locks just a little bit through the, uh, the winter season. Get a chance now. There's Vandenbroek. At Sabel. And the work still being done by those two Seiko riders at the front. Now they're going to have a very hard run into the finish because shortly they're going to take a right hand turn onto the big main road. And that's when it will be difficult to control any attacks. So little Petito and Shiria, or big Petito and Shiria, and uh, Shafrath. They're the three riders who seem to be the workhorses of this breakaway, or this chase. Mapai Rider is taking just close enough order to keep an eye on things without doing any driving right now. Certainly four very strong Mapai Riders in this leading group of 30. Johan Museo, Franco Ballerini, Nico Matin, and Frank Vandenbrucker. This is a very difficult part of the course too because it, it, it switches and winds all the way through the Belgian fields there before it comes back onto that big main road and then it's almost a straight run into the finish. Well, they're just about holding off the main field and uh, there's one lotto rider in this group at the moment near the tail and the gap is still one minute so they're not going anywhere at the moment Blyleven's sitting on the wheel there of Peter van Pietigem in the yellow jerseys in fact it looks as if uh, Yatislav Ekimov is in this group as well so a lot of riders hiding in this field they're sitting at the back just waiting for the race to develop and waiting to see exactly what unfolds and hoping that uh, later on they can unleash a deadly sprint when it comes down to that long finishing straight in the streets of Wavelgem and all the time there's just three men at the front of this group holding off the onslaught of the main field who are still hovering at around about the 45 second mark well it would be nice to catch a glimpse of them from the helicopter right now maybe we can take a top spot of them because Certainly, no, there are so many passengers in this breakaway. There's a lot of riders planning a late attack, it seems to me. The speed is still pretty high, though, being enforced by those three riders on the front. Now there's an attack coming. It looks like it's Nico Matin going again, so he's already had one go. He's decided, I think he probably got the word from Johan Museo there, because just shortly before uh, we came to this part of the course, he was riding alongside Museo, and I think uh, he got the nod from Johan, who said, OK, go for it, let's soften these guys up. Yes, well, that's caused uh, York Schaffer to grimace a little bit, because uh, they've been jumped around by another rider, yet another rider from Mappé, uh, Nico Matin. I'm not too sure whether he's got away or not right now, but the cameras will show us very shortly. Here he is. Raced a couple of times in England in the old Tour of Britain milk race. 
and Nico Matam when he was a Belgian national amateur rider but now he's riding for Mappe and this is his second time the first time looked to have been good enough but they got brought back now he's got a little bit of a gap again and he's just about 20 kilometers on the finish so he's still a fair way to go to hold them off especially on these sort of roads it won't be easy at all it certainly won't be but he is a good time trialist he won the amateur version of the grand prix eddie Merckx around brussels around about five years ago so he does know how to ride on his own but to hold off a full group of riders like that over 20 kilometers is going to be very difficult but for the moment he's succeeding because he's opened up around about 10 seconds nine seconds is the official time gap to the group behind but still it's not ruffled the feathers of the seiko riders at the front they're still riding still keeping the tempo there they are hoping that he will go out to 10 or 15 seconds and then start to weaken and they'll just pick him up as a matter of course and hopefully destroy one mape rider in the same uh, same process but i don't know about that petito still working hard here and shiria nine seconds is his first check and then you see it's 130 so it's only 121 uh, back to the group we're looking at right now which is not that much when you know the nature of the course on the running uh, down towards the finish clever move by Mappe there because you can see they're all queuing up now behind that's Frank Vandenbroek just having a quick word with Johan Museo now on the left hand side of the screen and just a little bit further back is Franco Ballerina so you can see just how this Mappe team rides like a team they all talk to each other they communicate in the main field and they're obviously now just waiting for Nico Matan to be caught he was sent out there as the rabbit to try and take the sting out of the power of the chase of these riders here who are at the moment riding along at 50 kilometers an hour and I think once he gets caught we'll see a counter-attack coming from somebody like Ballerini well you sound as though he will get caught Paul because uh, he started to feel the pressure I think at the moment he's starting to rock the top half of his body just yeah. a little bit it's so difficult to ride on your own at 50 kilometers an hour on a course like this especially with the long straight open roads of Belgium because you're always in sight you can never get into a situation where you're out of sight out of mind and what happens these three riders behind they're just setting a tempo I think good enough to make sure that his lead doesn't start to increase over the 15 20 second mark and eventually he'll start to weaken and just get reeled in Crosswind has got the whole race here pushed into the right hand gutter of the road so it's making it very difficult for anybody to make the pace now. The only way up is on the wind side of the bunch. The two uh, Cannondale boys seem happy to just continue with the pace making. Sitting back there Mario Cipollini very happy with the work being done by his two boys on the front got them setting a, setting a very good tempo and I think they're pretty happy with the work that's being done by Shafrath here as he swings across to the left hand side just to give enough space for those two Seiko riders to come through. Well, you can see that Mata has not made very great progress in the ranking system 144th this year but around about 12 to 1300 riders classified each year now and it's getting bigger and bigger all of the time But his job on the Mappe team normally is one of helping and today well it could be one of winning certainly could this is uh, a slight drag uphill it's given us six percent here it's hardly a climb in this area but certainly it, making the legs of Nico Matan hurt an awful lot as it's doing exactly the same to Mario Sierra who's trying to make sure that Nico Matan doesn't get too far in front but you can see all of the riders queuing up behind it's not far to go 14 kilometers and counting from the finish Lars Mikkelsen also trying to get back into the action now a little bit of change of the guard here now as uh, gone is Mario Shiria his legs finally cracked on the climb now there'll be some new pacemakers up there and it might well give us a little bit of a new attack as well all the cheers then for Nico Mata continues on his way towards the finish in Wavelgum bit of a dodgy corner to come out of there the uh, directional islands in fact Mickelson has leapt across there he's trying to get across to the lone leader of Nico Matin and in fact he's been covered almost immediately by Frank Vandenbroek so Vandenbroek doing a good team job here he's jumped right across to the wheel of Mickelson so he wasn't just moving up the outside of that group there in fact Mickelson's decided now was the time to go well Mickelson knows what it's like to win the event and he's looking for the opportunity he's obviously feeling pretty good form today there's uh, Vandenbroek setting up the pace, another useful man. Now, teammate chases friend at the moment. 
certainly is a very strange situation for Vandenbroek to be in because he's pulling away a rapid sprinter in the form of Lars Mikkelsen and uh, he's pulling him up to his own teammate but he obviously feels confident that if the two of them can get together they'll have a chance of staying away from the main field. Oh, well the speed of Vandenbroek here is ripped across look he's not even offered the pace making to Lars Mikkelsen he has just gone over that ground like a torpedo and is about to hook up with his teammate uh, Nico Matan so we now have two Mappe and one TVM rider on the front and I wonder now if this is the move well it could be It'll be interesting to see if Mikkelsen is going to work or not because he's in a situation of two against one and behind he's got a very good sprinter in the form of your own Blyleven's at the moment he's having a hard time just staying on the wheel of uh, Frank Vandenbroek and so's uh, Mata Mata had to grit his teeth there wobbled a little bit but he hooked up and he's gone clear now that's the gap they crossed which is not a great gap is it and this group is still clear of the rest of the field and still they're leaving the pace making to Mario Skidia and to Jan Pafaf certainly is a very interesting situation now those three riders have got 14 seconds so almost as soon as Vandenbroek made contact the group uh, started to increase their advantage over the main field and in fact race radio is telling us that uh, Andre Schmiel is in this group at the moment although I've not been able to see him anywhere so he must be sitting at the back somewhere well, we haven't seen him at all, but there is a lot of rider I haven't ID down the back of the race. It didn't look like uh, Smill's style, but if they're saying he's in there, they must have worked the numbers out by now. certainly feel it's strange to see Lars Mickelson riding so hard with two riders from a different team Nico Matin there wearing number seven and number eight on the back of Frank Vandenbroek because he's got every excuse not to work in this group because I think that the best man in the group behind is his own teammate your own Blyleaf and so I think uh, there'll be a few interesting words at the team car after this well I couldn't agree more actually and Mickelson who uh, speaks very good English and is a pretty nice guy he really should have had a bit more sense and uh, decided not to help these two escape because I don't think they complained being both on the same team they'd understand they outnumber him it looks as though Nico Matan though is suffering a little bit now because Frank Vandenbroek is absolutely flying here unbelievable the power this man has got he's got real skinny legs and they've actually stretched out their advantage now to 20 seconds over the main field but obviously Mickelson feels if he's riding with these two men that he's got a very great chance because certainly when it comes to the finish they're going to start attacking him one at a time the old one two trick and he feels that he can control every one of those and must then think that he can go on and win the sprint well Petito and Shiri here Seiko uh, obviously still committed to try and get Cipollini up now the two uh, Mappe boys have a little chat here Ballerini and Museu and just behind uh, Cipollini just staying out of trouble and not doing anything at all just hoping his teammates can carry him across this gap in fact another Mappe rider in the group as well there uh, Andrea Tapia I haven't seen very much of him so far this afternoon so obviously working themselves very well in force now more riders coming to the front to try and work to try and pull it all back Laurent Lefebvre there the rider from Festina helping the Team Telecom men to try and pull it back but I tell you one thing Frank Vandenbroek is certainly going for it he's riding a tremendous race he looks like he's had a nice little bit of rest after the victory in Paris Nice recovery period is now over and he's now out to see this business you know he's going to start favorite to win Liège Baston Liège or Flesh on next week I'm sure of that now certainly will he rode the uh, Tour of Flanders last weekend his first event first time he rode at one of the major World Cup events he's going to miss out this weekend on riding Paris-Roubaix because he wants to go down to the south of France to train around the San Rafael area and then come back for Flesh Wallon and Liège Baston Liège and that would be a great move for him for a French speaking Belgium to come up to ride in those Gardens classics so now uh, Mikkelsen's got himself in a, a Mappe sandwich here he's gone through the gap and not opening significantly despite the speed of Van der Broek who's pulling better than the other two there's a counter-attack going across from the main field here this is one that rides from Scrinio it looks like Pier Piero again P and this guy's had an amazing race he's ca attacked and counter-attacked at least four times now so Dario Pieri trying to cross the gap on his own he's got that 22 years of age 
He's had two victories so far this season, one in the Tour of Langkawi, which was a, a racer in Malaysia, and then another very good victory on the first stage of the three days of La Pana, covered immediately by Andrea Tappi, and right onto his wheel, Mario Cipollini. So they're not letting him, letting him get too far off the front, but this, in fact, is very good for the three leaders, because once these little attacks start coming, once the, the rider gets caught, then they'll slow down, which will give the advantage to the three leaders. Tappy knows all about Pieri, 22 years, but he's jumped on him straight away. And you see nobody willing to come through at all because the uh, Mappe boy Tappy isn't going to help out anybody. And it doesn't look as though TVM have got anybody in here apart from Bly Lavens, who's the sprinter. They did have Peter Van Pietigem up there, but now Rolf Sorensen's deciding he's going to take a few risks and look at that straight onto his wheel, covered by Johan Museo in person. Sorry, young man, you're not going anywhere without me. And Yatislav Ekimov is up there as well. Now one or two new faces beginning to get the tails up and might feel they've got a real chance here, but they've got to close down that break first. Ekimov now in that very familiar time trial star, which took him to so many world records as a rider on the Soviet Red Guard team has now tried to go but immediately you see the counter-attacks are moving up the gap is still stretching because of the stop go attitude of the chase it's up to 31 seconds now Giovanni Lombardi riding very close to the front there he'll be thinking about uh, it all coming back together for his man Eric Zabel another great uh, pursuiter Stuart O'Grady on the front here now he's starting to stir it up because he and Henk Vogels realize that if they can pull it back together their man Frederick Mokasa who is also in the group here has a good chance of getting the victory in Gent Wavel again but they might have left it too late because it's up now over 30 seconds well O'Grady was in a similar position in this event last year but he was racing the first place when he attacked then and they reeled him in and he was put back in the bunch now Still riding a nice flurry of attacks trying to launch themselves off here now. Maybe something will get going. Vandenbroek and his two mates up front are going to keep the pace steady and just hope that they stop and they go. Johan Museo in person at the front covering all of these moves for his own teammate. Vandenbroek in second position there. It has come down just a little bit to 29 seconds. And the man leading the chase there, Frederic Guedon, winner of Paris-Roubaix from last year. Well, he certainly plays a more prominent role in the action now, Guedon, since he won Paris-Roubaix. Look, hasn't been with him just yet this season, but he's certainly been in at the kill. Nine kilometres to go. And still the riders trying to bridge the gap. Some good movement here down there now. But you see that long straight road is not really in the favour of these riders in the lead, Paul. It looks as if Vandenbroek's having a bit of a hard time there because he was three or four lengths off the back of uh, his two uh, breakaway companions there, sandwiched in the middle, Lars Mikkelsen. And uh, Vandenbroek really seemed to be suffering to try and pull himself back up to the slipstream. But Nico Matin certainly putting everything he can into this breakaway now. And uh, it may well be that we we'll start to get some kind of tactical manoeuvres coming as we get just a little bit closer to the finish. Because after all, you have to bear in mind it is two against one. Well, Mata, when he was caught by Vanderbroek, he was hurting. But he's obviously got his second wind now. And let's not forget that Vanderbroek has been putting in some terrifying turns of speed at the front. But the gap is still there because the breakaway hasn't really escaped. The tempo is very high for all concerned. Uh, Lars Mikkelsen, you know, he's a very good finisher. And he could well take on Vanderbroek. I can't believe that Mata has got too much left in those legs. He seems to be giving just about 110% now in the service of his leader for the day at least in Vandenbroek. Well Mattan must be uh, definitely devoting himself to make sure that this breakaway succeeds and they must start to worry a little bit about the presence of Lars Mikkelsen there because he did win Gent Wave again before and it was in a situation like this and then in that situation he was discounted by Maurizio Fondriest when it came up to the finish line I don't think he was uh, quite expecting the sprint that Lars Mikkelsen was unable to was able to unleash on that day a rain shower which has recently passed through and made the roads very wet here too and uh, still Mikkelsen prepared to take up the running and give Matan a hand but I wouldn't do too much of a hard turn at the front otherwise you'd probably find Van der Buch will jump away there's Mikkelsen fourth in 96 first uh, the year before that no result last year and now in in the last three here this time around 
a little bit of rain starting to come down making the last few kilometers more treacherous as well not too many major difficult corners on the running but once they go over this bridge they have to take a, a, a slightly difficult corner to the left and that is where if they're not too careful there could be a little incident Miko Mata wearing number seven though has decided that he's going to go to the front and these riders certainly have done everything they can today to try and outbox the sprinters but even with 30 seconds and seven kilometers to go it's still far from over because a main reaction in the main field could still pull it back well I think the Seiko boys haven't got the firepower there's only been two of them working in that chase group Telecom have got one or two there but I see they put Lombardi up near the front here now there he is in third wheel just now or fourth wheel if we're moving along the line here Fine Hank Vogels is now working hard then comes Stuart O'Grady and uh, as I say Lombardi a sprinter is also a good workhorse for the Deutsche Telecom team and he's in the action now trying to desperately to close down this gap before they get into the finishing straight at Wevelgum and they're only four miles from the finish now well, Stuart O'Grady taking a few risks going around that corner there in fact he went round it a lot faster than the, uh, to the TV camera bike was prepared to go there now up to 38 seconds so all the time despite one or two riders from certain teams coming to the front and chasing this leading group of three riders still starting to edge out a few more seconds In a good break and Nico Martin is the man who seems now totally committed he's back up front again you will watch these white cor these corners especially over the white stripes on the road which tend to become a little bit slippery six kilometers inside to go to the finish now the adrenaline will be flowing now Van der Broek can sense uh, a good victory coming his way here providing Lars Mikkelsen doesn't get in the way Lars we have discounted Matan because of the way he's riding he seems content now to keep this pace up for his teammate well, the only way he's got a chance of winning is if uh, Vandenbroek could tee something up by attacking first and then waiting for Nico Matan to counter attack Nico Matan doesn't have any major victories to his credit although he was a great amateur since he's turned professional he's really tried to make his way as a team domestique they come now through the town of Mainen. The next town on the agenda is going to be Wavelgem and a very long straight finish into the town centre just outside the church, which all of these riders know very well indeed, having most of them ridden Ghent Wavelgem in the past. And Frank Vanderbroek, I suppose, is really the, the most local rider here in Belgium because his uh, father actually lives just off the course and his dad, in fact, is driving in the race car from a different team. He's the team mechanic for the Lotto squad. And the Lotto squad, that we believe, has got Schmill in the back, but in the chase group. But uh, the funny thing is that we haven't seen him do any of the chasing down. He just seems as though he's riding towards the finish. Maybe he's winding down from a tough tour of Flanders and uh, thinking of winding up again for the upcoming Paris-Roubaix. He's in the break, all right, but he's not actually come to the fore at all. Tricky few corners here as we come through Maine, and this little bit of uh, rain that's fallen down has made the road quite treacherous. And these riders keep changing direction, changing their angle as they go into the corners here. Vandenbroek knows the finish now very well. He's just throwing his bike around all of these corners, realizing just how dangerous it would be to ease up at this point of the action. And now, coming alongside Patrick Lefebvre, a quick word to Frank Vandenbroek from the uh, team manager there of the Mappé squad. And as soon as he came alongside there, Vandenbroek dropped to the back. Lars Mikkelsen now has decided to take up the pace setting at the front. He obviously too is thinking that he's got a great chance of winning here because his more chance of finishing in the top three is a certainty than his own teammate Jeroen Blyleavens has of winning the bunch sprint because once it comes down to a bunch sprint there are all kinds of mistakes you can make. Well, there is Patrick Lefebvre who seems to be always in the hot seat these days in the big time bike races and now a little word in the ear of Frankie. I can't hear what he's saying, but I think he's probably told in the proximity of the chase. It's still there, flick of the left arm to call through Mikkelsen. And uh, Matan just grits his teeth and goes through and does a good turn at work at the front. And it looks as though Matan is going. Now, this is what they've got to do, and it's good to see it happen. But Matan, I suspect the weaker of the two, has decided to attack to draw the sting of Mikkelsen and try and give Van der Broek a soft ride up to the line now. But Mikkelsen showing a bit of experience there, recognizing Matan is not that strong, he gave him some room and forced Vandenbroek back through. That was a good piece of riding by a man who's outnumbered. 
certainly is. I think the word I heard Patrick Lefebvre shout was Nico Demared, which means that Nico is the man who should attack. So maybe they're trying to set this up for a victory for Nico Matin, which is why he went clear there. But, you know, obviously Lars Mikkelsen realizes, as you've said, that Matin is the weakest rider, so he's just going to keep pegging him back all of the time. And now the situation has come that Mikkelsen realizes he's got to keep the pace high, otherwise these two riders are just going to keep attacking him one after the other. And here comes the other attack right now, and now Mikkelsen immediately reacts this time and chases him through the puddles of Wavelgum here to try and get on his way. But look at the speed, he's just ripped away, but Mikkelsen I think is equal to it, Paul. It looks as if he's going to get back onto the wheel there, and Nico Matan has put all of the work in this afternoon. He couldn't follow the attack of Frank Vandenbroek, and Mikkelsen has just got back onto the slipstream there, but it took an awful lot of energy to get there. A double take by Vandenbroek, the wrong man has caught him. And so he's turned off and he's going to allow Matan to rejoin them here. If Matan's got energy any left at all, he will try and come back up there. And I'm not quite sure what that manoeuvre was for. And uh, I think if he does come back up here, the first thing he'll do is try and attack. I, I don't know whether he's indicated to take the slipstream or what. But anyway, Mikkelsen's having none of it. He's lifted the pace again to try and stop Matan getting on. Matan's doing it, he's starting to recover, he's starting to come up to the back wheel now and surely if he's got any energy left at all he's going to try and attack because I think Vandenbroek is trying to set it up for a victory for his own teammate. Well share and share alike seems to be the motto and there goes Matan and immediately Mikkelsen is straight onto his wheel but it's a long time since we've seen two riders in the same team really work over a fellow professional like this. In amateur racing you see it happen so often where they just don't attack the rider on his own and very often they lose out to him. Here's two top professionals taking no chance whatsoever. They are softening up Mikkelsen so much so that now Vandenbroek has gone again and this time I think is the killer blow. Well Mikkelsen made a major mistake there, he went straight after Matin and he didn't react once Vandenbroek went and if he wasn't on the wheel there is no way at a stage like this he's going to manage to close it down. So Frank Vandenbroek has played the card rightly, he tried to set it up for his own teammate and his friend Nico Matin. He made him attack and he made him and waited for him to come back and now's the turn of Mikkelsen but I'm sorry to say Lars, I think it's just a little bit too late. And I think also that Matin is inspired enough to come and latch onto the back wheel of Lars Mikkelsen. Now if he gets onto the wheel of Mikkelsen in this last kilometre uh, then I think Mikkelsen will sit up and try and beat him in the sprint otherwise he's going to be the victim of a 1-2 from Mappe. But uh, I have to say that Frank van der Broek is looking better and better every time we see him race. It certainly is. This is a question of survival now. These riders jumped away about 15 kilometres to go from the finish. And now Frank van der Broek has certainly played his cards right. He waited until Lars Mikkelsen had done all of the work and, and worked with these two riders from the same team, the Mappé squad himself and Nico Matin. And once they felt that they had the beating of him, they started to attack him one at a time. And uh, it's a great performance by these two riders, two very young riders on the Mappé squad and I think the crowd there pretty happy with Vandenbroek's ride and the finish is up by the church and we're into the home straight now a man has won the tour of Luxembourg the tour of Austria tour of the Mediterranean Paris Brussels and Paris Nice he can now add to that lot Gimp Wavelgum and he really is a great prospect for the future Frank Vandenbroek uh, takes the victory and you see at the end of the day it wasn't one for the sprinters again as Lars Mikkelsen comes away Nico Matan doesn't care a two-handed salute for him as well because the Mappe, rightly so, will feel they ruled Gent Wavelgum today. Fantastic performance by a local boy, and I wouldn't have thought that Frank Vandenbroek was on the top of very many people's favourites list this morning. Well, here's the big battle now, and this is for fourth place, and it looks as though Schmill is at the kill here. He's just got away to hold them off to the line as Schmill comes in ahead of the coffee dish rider Debian, and the bunch led home there by who else? Eric Zabel, the big sprinter. So Zabel will be sixth today, and Vogels, who was seventh, is with Paul. I think that was a tough finish coming in there, but an unbelievable ride by the two Mappe riders. <coughs> yeah, I mean, Nico Matan, they took the initiative, he, he nicked off, probably 20k to go, and they let Vandenbroek just ride away, I couldn't believe it. 30 guys just let him ride away, two Mappe guys. Incredible. Well, you and Stuart tried to pull it all back together at the end for uh, Fred Moncassin, but it ended up that you were sixth place. Yeah, Roger came up and said, right, I'll put in three big, three k's on the front at 60k an hour. We weren't bringing them back. So we got swamped. And uh, I mean, it was just a case of getting them minor place in. And uh, Schmuel nicked off with a k to go, and Zabel won the sprint last second.
Well, there you go. Sixth place is pretty good, but also coming up to Paris-Roubaix, your morale must be quite high now. Uh, it's good I had some power on the flat, but still six is nothing, and I'm really peed off. That was a very difficult way to get away in the end of game Wavel game, especially with two riders like uh, Frank Vandenbroek and Nico Matin. Yeah, I mean, Matin did a, a good attack, and, and uh, yeah, of course I could have sit and uh, waited, but my experience is in this race is that, uh, yeah, when I won it, we were also three, but from three different teams, you know. Today it was two from uh, Mappe and one from TVM, and so, yeah, I don't know how you say it in English, you know, the when the cat is out of the mile or whatever, you know? Right. Yeah. One last question though, quickly. It was amazing that three riders went out. Did you really think that you could stay clear from the, to the finish? Yeah, I, I've, I see Mazen make a good gap. He became tired in the end, but uh, Frank Fren Brugge has a lot of uh, horsepower and, and I also did a good job in the end, so yeah. Vandenbroek looked very strong over those last kilometers. Sure, he was determined and I mean, yeah, he also likes to win now in Mappe, you know? <laughs> Yeah. Frank, normally we regard uh, Gent Wavel game as being a race for the sprinters, but today you prove that to be wrong. Yes, uh, Gent Wavel game the last few years, um, we've always talked about the sprint, but uh, in the last few years there's always been less sprints and it's been groups of around about 20 riders, so I knew that there was a chance that the breakaway could succeed today. That's uh, with uh, with Mappé, we did a good job. Did you think that when the three of you got away, you had a good chance of staying away to the finish? I looked behind and I could see there were not too many psycho riders able to work. And I had a TVM rider with me. So I knew that uh, all the three top teams were represented and nobody was really going to chase. I gave everything that I could. After Paris-Nice, Game Wevel Game, good win. It's a very good start to the season. And so this is how Frank Vandenbroek will remember the finish. It certainly has been a great start to the season. He's left them all behind again, just like he did in Paris-Nice. And he has the pleasure of his friend and teammate Nico Matin taking third as well. And there's no doubt now Vandenbroek will continue to remain a favourite for the Classics in the Ardennes in Belgium in a week or so's time. As the result, Lars Mikkelsen taking the second place and Matan Schmilit was in fourth. Further down, Vogel seventh. Van Pietigen continues his great season too with eighth this time, beating the Dutch sprinter Blylevens, who finished ninth. That's it for the moment from World Cycling Productions. I hope you've enjoyed this one. Another classic for the shells. Until the next time, for Paul Sherwin, I'm Phil Ligger saying so long for now.